thank you everyone who's uh, here and joining us um, and taking the time out of your morning to learn more about the invention process um, from Mike Kelly. Uh, before we do that, I just want to take a quick moment to introduce myself. I'm Amanda Gilbert, the Communications Coordinator with Queen's Partnerships and Innovation. Uh, we host a number of workshops and um, accelerator programs with the support of uh, the Government of Canada through FedDev Ontario. Um, if you want to take a moment and just put in the chat who you are and who your business is or who your business are, um, that would be great. Um, and I'd also just like to take a moment to acknowledge that Queen's University um, and the Kingston region is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Um, this territory is still home to many Indigenous people um, across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work and learn on these lands today. Um, if you're not joining us from the Kingston area, um, but elsewhere in Canada or the US, uh, and you know the lands on which you're situated, please also feel free to add that into the chat as well. Um, and if you don't know, there's a great tool called Whose Land, which I will include in the chat and encourage you to check it out and learn more about um, Turtle Island and the treaties that have been put in place across the country. Um, so we're going to jump right into handing the reins over to, to Mike Kelly. Um, Mike is a member of our Queen Startup Runway, and he's currently working on the Mantis Mirror, which is a bike helmet mounted um, mirror, and it's aimed at making the road safer to navigate for cyclists. Uh, Mike is a serial entrepreneur um, and he's been a serial entrepreneur for decades and he's brought several products uh, from ideas to market. Um, we will have the presentation portion to start and then there'll be a question and answer period at the end. Um, so if you even if you add a question into the chat, we'll address it at the end of the presentation. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Mike and uh, he'll lead us through the session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I assume there's people there, although I can't see anybody except for Amanda. Feel free to turn your video on. It makes it a little more interactive if you have video. Um, there were a lot more people registered for this, so perhaps they'll come in and uh, hopefully it won't adjust things too much. But um, well, yeah, we'll have questions at the end. There could be quite a few. This is a topic area, by the way, that, uh, you know, I've got a seven point process, for example, that you'll see later on. And for each point, I could talk hours hours on each topic. So we're putting this into 30 minutes. So if you hear a point of reference that you're curious about or need clarification on, make a note, write it down, put it in a question, and then we can chat uh, in the latter part of the session. Okay. Uh, is everyone's chat function working? Either with a thumbs up or a hi or a yes? Okay, cool. All right. Well, without further ado, let me get right into this and uh, let's learn a little bit more about this. Okay, so despite the, the tone or the title that we've got here, uh, without inventors, the world would still be in the Stone Ages. So if you are an inventor or thinking of doing so, please continue that thought process because the world would be in a bad place without inventors. And just from a disclaimer perspective, uh, I will read this so I get it all right. This presentation is for informational purposes only and in no way is intended as professional advice. Always consult with a qualified professional embarking on before embarking on your inventing journey. That includes lawyers, patent agents, trademark attorney, all that stuff, okay? But hopefully this will provide you with the insight to give you direction to investigate certain areas more so. All right, uh, I love Einstein. Too bad he's not around still, but you know, one of his quotes was, if at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. That simply means that if your idea makes too much sense, it's probably not going to be successful or it's probably already been done. And on the flip side of that, because your idea may not make sense to people you're talking to, it makes it hard. It makes it really hard to move forward because you lose that confidence factor very quickly. And unless you can let this like water off a duck's back when you're trying to bring something to market, it's gonna be an extra long haul. Okay. Let me move my screen out here. So what constitutes an invention? Pretty vague question. Just straight from the dictionary. So Merriam-Webster, it's a noun, invention, to invent. And it's a device or a contrivance or a process after study and experimentation. 
My preference, though, is for the second definition. That is, it's a product of imagination. And if you have a vivid imagination, you're going to be in a good position to start the inventing process. Too fast. In a more general sense, in my own mind, this is how it applies to me. An invention typically applies to something, at least to you, it's a perceived problem that you can actually come across. And when you see that perceived problem, you might start thinking, is there a way to solve this problem? And that's how it happens. And because of that, there's no shortage. If you're wondering, what can I invent? Trust me, there are no shortage of problems in the world. So there are many opportunities to come up with an invention. Now, that being said, you know, the idea area that you tackle should have some relevance to whatever your knowledge base experientially or empirically you may actually have in your toolkit. So for example, if you want to, you know that energy weakness in the, I guess in the entire world is gonna hit upon us at some point, and you wanna come up with a source of new energy, if you're thinking about fusion, nuclear fusion, you probably better have a background in molecular physics or something. Otherwise, you're probably wasting your time. Okay, So make sure your background is somewhat relevant. And if it's on the very simplistic side of inventing, then it's open to just about anybody. Now, this is important if, in fact, you're planning to bring a product to market. There's two criteria that it has to meet or good luck. The first one it has to be novel. That simply means that no one has done it before. Okay. Now, this also applies that if you're planning to do a, a patent application later on, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But the other one, it has to be non-obvious, and this is a tricky one. So if you come up with an idea that no one's invented, like breathing oxygen, how you would do it portably or something, if someone in that field says to themselves, well, that's a no-brainer. I, I understand that. That's basic. It's not non-obvious. So it has to be non-obvious to the other people that are looking at it, specifically even more so in the investor world and to the patent world. If they think of, well, I, I, I do that myself, it's not non-obvious, okay? So novel and non-obvious are important. Now, if you can just raise your hand, if you've ever come up with an idea Now, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, by the way, I've got a psych background also. I think just about anybody on the planet that's awake has come up with an idea at some point in time. It may be a fleeting idea. It may be something they've thought long and hard about. And you may have done nothing with it, but coming up with an idea is something humans do. Humans like to innovate. My next question. Raise your hand if you've come up with an idea and actually gone further to make it into a usable product. You may not have actually brought it to market, but you've actually made the idea into a usable product. Cool, all right, we've got at least two that I can see, all right. Well, if you said yes to that prior question, you can call yourself an inventor. That's it, that's what the criteria is for being an inventor. You take something that no one's done before and you turn it into something usable. It doesn't have to be patented. It doesn't have to be copyrighted or trademarked. It doesn't have to go to market. You don't have to sell it. If you just invent things, as many people do, some people may never see you know, the light of day from that, from a sales perspective or a marketing perspective. But that's the first step to go forward if you do plan to bring a product to market. You have to actually make it happen. Now, I would like your answers in the chat of what you think this thing is. I want a one word answer. A one word answer. Take a look, a good hard look at that. What do you think that thing is? I'll give you a hint. Go back my last slide about what I said about if you brought a product to fruition. And countdown five, four, three, two, one. It's a handle. Not sure. Handle, two handles, good. A hand warmer. Interesting. Okay. 
Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's an invention. That's it. I came across a problem. I didn't do a whole lot more with it, but after time that problem festered and I decided to come up with a solution to solve the problem. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not gonna make any reference whatsoever because this is one of many ideas that I've come to fruition with that may actually end up going to market because there are thousands of people, maybe not tens of thousands, certainly not hundreds of thousands, but certainly thousands of people who've experienced the same problem I have who could use this invention, okay? So I found the problem, took an idea, and turned it into a real product with some very simplistic prototyping. Of course, this doesn't look like anything like you would buy in a hardware store or an electronics store or whatnot, okay? So this is an invention, it does something. By the way, the reason I did this is because it was gonna cost me several hundred dollars to solve the problem otherwise. And this very cost-effective little widget solves the problem for me, okay? That's an invention. They can look very, very simplistic. Now, there are two types of invention. I'm talking very high level here, okay, just to give you an idea. You've heard the mousetrap expression before. Well, I'll you'll see why mousetrap is used a lot with inventing coming up. But there is the first type of invention, it's called the mousetrap. And I mean that metaphorically. It means it's the first item to do what was originally intended to do. Okay. So if you were the first person to invent a spoon, that would be the mousetrap of spoons. Okay, everyone with me? It's the first to do what you want to intend. If you're inventing the wheel, the first one to do the wheel and it's functional, that is the mousetrap of wheels. Okay. Now the mousetrap of any product idea is usually the most difficult because you have something else to deal with. And I call it a pioneering effort. When you try and convince people that they should like your idea as much as you do, it's gonna be incredibly hard because most of them won't even recognize maybe that the problem exists. So that's why it's called a pioneering effort. And one of the, one of the inventions I did bring to market earlier on, uh, it was a pioneering effort. It was for the automotive sector. And when I first started talking to people about that, they said, why, why would you want that? Like, just do it, do it what everybody else does, which was nothing, by the way, okay, and it affected visibility when they were driving. And it took probably over a year to get people in the industry to sort of come to the resolve of, oh, now, now I get why you'd want to do that, okay? So the reason I'm telling you this is because if you're looking to be quick in the market, you do not want to do the original mousetrap. So what's the second type of product? It's the better mousetrap. The second type of invention is a better mousetrap. And it's simply an improvement on the original idea. Now, the good news is there's competition out there. So you don't have to explain your better idea as to what it's really meant to solve because people before you've already done that. They might have even patented it, for example. Okay. But the downside is that um, there's competition out there. So your better idea needs to be better. And if you take a look on the right side of the screen, that is an actual better mousetrap. That was filed a few years after the original mousetrap you saw in the first picture. And this is scary. This is an actual loaded gun with a spring mechanism that if the rodent touched that mechanism, the gun would blow it apart, blow it to pieces. That was a real product. I don't know if it ever went to market, but it was conceivably, at least in the inventor's mind, a better mousetrap. Rumor has it, by the way, that inventor actually was missing a few fingers. So inventing uh, could be a bit of a challenge for you. Be careful what you're going to invent. Now, the USPTO, the United States Patent Office, 
has actually issued almost 4,500 patents on mouse traps. Why? It's because rodents are not going away. And if you've ever had a rodent problem, you're wondering, well, what should I do? Well, you log online, you start searching, and you'll see lists and lists of devices, mouse traps or whatnot, some benign, some not, that can help you deal with the problem. But are they perfect? No, no, they're not. That's a bonus for you, by the way, because it always leaves opportunity. So don't get discouraged. If you had your heart set on a mouse trap, a better mouse trap that you've written down in pencil and done some rough prototypes, and now because you listen to Mike Kelly, he said there was an over 4,400 already done, don't let that discourage you because you may have the next better mouse trap. Now, is the idea unique or not? So let's say, for example, you've heard the expression one in a million. You're one in a million. You're pretty unique, right? Would you agree? Okay. So let's say you've come up with the next best idea, either an original mousetrap or a better mousetrap, and it's one in a million. Wow, that's, that's impressive. That's really unique, okay? But is it really? Imagine if, for example, you came up with an idea for the automotive sector. It's a massive market, massive market, lots of people to serve, lots of money to be made potentially, okay? And you're one in a million. Well, let's just focus on the city of metropolitan Detroit. There's about 3 million people in Detroit. So if you do some quick math, that means roughly there's two other people out there that have the same idea that you've come up with because you're only one in a million. Now I can speak to this experientially. This actually happened to me. So I'd spent a lot of time and money on a particular product in the early stages, as you'll see later on, and I filed the patent for it, which you may or may not want to do again, as you'll see later on. But somewhere down the road before the patents had actually been applied or uh, issued and so on, I received a phone call. And the individual on the other line was from the Michigan area saying or accusing me of stealing his idea. Now, fast forward. That person, by the way, ended up becoming my first shareholder and first investor. But yes, he actually came up with the same idea somewhere around the same time I did. I can only imagine. But in the US, you know, who gets a patent has all the rights. So if you're unique, don't wait. What I'm trying to tell you is don't wait. Write it down in a book. Revisit it every so often. Maybe your things, opportunities will change. Uh, you know, resources will change. But if you think it's viable, don't wait. Okay. Now, you know, this is a good reason to file for intellectual property. I do have some thoughts on it that I'll share with you as this goes on. But generally speaking, if you can afford time and money resources to have a patent filed and you think your idea has credibility, get it done. But that doesn't mean you have to, okay? Now, if you're looking by way of, uh, you're taking your idea into getting it protected, there's a couple of things you can think about. You may wanna make money. You may wanna increase the economy. You may wanna get people employed. Uh, you may want to just feel a sense of satisfaction monetarily or whatnot by selling the product and getting a lot of success. Or you may just want to help mankind. If it's the latter, you don't need to patent the idea because you're wanting people to have access to it. Okay, So you're going to get the product out there. People are going to look at it. They're going to say it's great. And they're going to say, oh, I think I can make this less expensively or better or whatnot. And they'll do that because there's no hurdles for them. Frankly, even if you do patent it, that doesn't stop a lot of unscrupulous people, unethical people to do just that anyway. But the patent is a tool that you can use to a degree. Now, you all know what that is? Computer mouse? The computer mouse was never patented. They developed it. They never patented it. They wanted to share it with the world. 
the laptop computer that you're probably working on right now. It was never patented. So do you have to patent something? Not necessarily. There's an old adage out there that says, first to market gains the lion's share. It simply means if you can be first to market with an idea, the chances are in your favor that you will gain more market share than others coming on later with better ideas. Case in point, you know the company IBM. They came up with a product called the IBM PC, IBM PC before any of you were born. I can't see all of you on the screen, but I'm making an assumption. Okay, Trust me, I was a software. I had a software company. I wrote software for that thing. That thing was a piece of blank. It was a terrible piece of a technology. Other companies came on like Motorola and Zilog. Afterwards, they had better microprocessors, faster, you know, more cost-effective. It was a bit, they had better products, but it didn't matter. IBM took the lion's share. They went to market first. By the way, if you were in technology, you probably never heard of Zilog. They went out of business. They had a better product and they still went out of business because they were late to the party. Now, there, is a, there used to be a very simple way you could actually protect your idea. It was loosely called the poor man's invention protection concept. It was really simple. You wrote your idea down and as descriptive as you could, maybe a sketch or whatnot, you folded it up and you put it inside an envelope, you sealed the envelope, you self-addressed it and stamped the envelope and you mailed it back to yourself. So the post office would stamp it, giving it that government blessing, and you would receive it and never open it. Don't open it, okay? In 2013, that went away. So the USPTO, which is the holy grail of getting your patents done, meaning down in the US, they basically, uh, they switched from the first to invent. I mean, here I have a proof of, on a napkin that I invented this 10 years ago. That used to be valid in some cases. But after 2013, it was, it was first to file. So you had to file your patent to have that protectionism aspect from the age aspect is what it is. Now, that being said, still write your ideas down because you never know when you might use that kind of information. You should at some point, again, I'm talking if you're planning to bring your product to market in any form, get some kind of non-disclosure set forth as best you can, either formally or even verbally, you know, jointly agree that it be recorded or whatnot. But an NDA is valuable in the early development process so that you can start sharing ideas to start getting insights. So for example, a product I'm working on right now, I needed to get some quotes on molds, which are very expensive to do in this case. And I had to get the company's assurance that they wouldn't share the idea with somebody else. So they signed an NDA. Do you need a lawyer for that? Depends what your background knowledge is. Certainly there's a lot of examples on the internet. So do your due diligence. And if you need a lawyer or, or whatnot, get it done. Now, here's a caveat. If you're planning to sell this new idea on a broad basis, um, you know, some people will abide by the NDA, others won't. I too ran across that. I had to sue somebody. It cost me $20,000. This was a long time ago because they, they infringed on it, on what information I had shared with them. And they were stopped from doing it legally, but it still cost me 20000 to go through the process. So inventing is not for the faint of heart if you get into the marketing, the actual business side of it. Okay. Now, that being said, even though a person may not be ethical and is going to, uh, I'll sign it, but I don't care in their own mind. If they abuse it and take advantage of it, you can still use a signed NDA in a court of law at some point. Okay. If you plan to go to Asia, your NDA is basically useless. It has to do with cultural beliefs and so on. Asia is a very collectivist society as opposed to individual in North America, for example. And you know, they might sign your NDA, but have no intent on honoring it because it's not a bad thing. You know, you take a product and my mindset to help the world is to make a product better. So, oh, there's a good idea. Let me take it and make it better. Now to us, that may sound unethical like stealing, but in others, it may not be. 
But there is another document called an NNN, a non-use and non-circumvention agreement that is among ethical companies over in Asia and so on. They do recognize that. Okay. When in doubt, seek professional advice. Okay. The cool thing about the internet, there's a lot of information out there right now, but uh, and even things like AI, chat GPT, but I can tell you, I've found many instances of things I did early on that are completely wrong. I mean, I'm the, I was the inventor, I was on the patent, and yet chat GPT tells me somebody else is. That's not right. So, you know, make sure you get a few sources of information, double check. Okay, so this is my analogy of going through the invention process, meaning this is a vertical climb. It's not a flat run, okay? It's certainly a marathon, but it's an uphill battle. And the prize at the end of your, your challenges and so on might be monetary, they might be uh, recognition, they might be just a sense of, ah, oh, I feel good, I've saved somebody's life by bringing this idea to market, okay? So let me get into this. And this is where I could talk for hours on each step, so I'll try and keep it low. How are we doing on time, Amanda? We're at 10.30 right now, so we're still good. Okay. So the first one is problem identification. As I mentioned earlier on, there's no shortage of problems out there. If you could, for example, find a way to solve the garbage landfill problem that exists in the world, including our oceans and so on, wow, you can write your ticket. But there's a lot of aspects connected to that, regulatory aspects, government hurdles and so on, pollution, carbon footprint. And that's why the problem hasn't really been solved. Okay, But there's no shortage of problems out there. So my recommendation to you is, Find a problem that is more in your wheelhouse, more in your experience knowledge base, or maybe education base, and start searching in that area for things you want to do. If you're just a hobbyist, maybe you're working on a hobby, and you find an inconvenience when you use this particular hobby aspect. Okay? I, I love playing guitar, but I'm a terrible guitar player. Okay? But I do it for stress relaxation and so on. If I could find a way to put that knowledge in my head immediately and become a great guitar player, I'd pay for that, you know, within reason. Should I start investigating that? Oh, maybe, I've got a little bit of knowledge. Now, that being said, I'm too distracted with other things, so I'll leave that aside. But that's what I mean, find an area that you have a little bit of comfort zone with. Okay, ideation. Now on this side, on the right-hand side, you see a very tiny dollar sign and a relatively small clock. So that represents what will it cost you in money, relatively speaking, and how much time will it take? Ideation can be like that, or it could take months and months and months trying to figure out. So if you were trying to solve the garbage landfill problem, it would probably take you a lifetime to come up with a solution and a lot of money. Conversely, if you're just trying to find a solution to a very simple problem, how can I get my shoes to go on my feet a lot easier without having to bend down and tie them up? By the way, someone's already come up with the, the solution, but that's a much simpler thing to attack. So those two problems, one might take a little bit of money, some very simple prototyping, and maybe a little bit of time. Whereas if it's more advanced, like let's say you're in the software side and there's a lot of testing that goes on and you've got millions of lines of code to write, it's gonna take you more time and possibly more money if you're bringing outside help in. Market analysis. This is where the stuff hits the road, okay? The rubber hits the road. If you're planning to bring the product to market, you need to do some market analysis. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time and money, usually your time and your money, because without market analysis, outsiders aren't going to invest in you regardless, okay? So you can see the dollar symbol has gotten a little bigger and the time signal has gotten a little bigger. But there's a lot of things you can do here for market analysis. So you're trying to do this to see, is this perceived problem that I have that I've come up with a solution for, my ideation, is it a problem that all of everybody else has? Or maybe it's a niche group that has the same problem. And if so, you need to find that out. 
And, you know, today, it's so simple to do it today by way of social media. You have things like Facebook groups. So Amanda mentioned earlier that I'm currently working on a bicycle safety accessory. It was simple. I just contacted a lot of bicycle groups on Facebook, and I asked them if I could provide them with a nine-question survey for them to answer. I had 140 people respond to it. It was so easy. It still took a lot of time. It took, you know, many months tracking people down and revising things and so on. But it was relatively easy. And that was one of the catalysts that then told me, ah, I think I've got something here. It's not just me that's seen this problem. Other people have it too. And by the way, they're willing to pay up to $50 for it. That was one of the questions I asked them. Okay, so very easy market research. Now, this is where the dollar sign gets bigger and the time gets bigger. And you go, those two symbols are relative. Um, prototyping. If you're planning to bring the product to market, you have to do it. And it can be intense. It normally starts with, with simple aspects whereby you're um, doing an alpha test, which is something that you'll just run amongst yourself and or your advisors or friends or partners or team, your squad, whatever you want to call them. Okay. And it won't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. It can be something as simple as a low fidelity sketch or a low fidelity styrofoam mock-up of what you're proposing. It's especially important if this is a mousetrap kind of idea. Okay, if it's a pioneering idea, for me to tell you something you've never seen or recognized before, unless you see something, in your, you can hold in your hand and visualize it, it won't make any sense to you whatsoever. And then if you're trying to make a better mousetrap, you need to show some contextual aspect as to what makes it better. Why should I get rid of my other product that I have? It, it does the job. It's not great, but it does the job. Why should I get rid of it and pay more money for yours? So you have to have something that people can wrap their mind around. At a minimum, a sketch will work if you're a good sketch artist or can get something done to convey what it is you're trying to show. And again, less is more, okay? So keep it simple. If it's too intricate, you're just gonna turn people off. So keep it simple, okay? Now we go from there to where we're actually going to be um, maybe up to a high fidelity functional prototype. It may not be ready for prime time. It may not be the MVP, which stands for minimum viable product to bring to market, but it's something very functional. It looks real from a distance. Okay. This, by the way, is, is something I'm currently the stage in with a product that I'm bringing to market. Uh, and by the way, there were a lot of renditions before that, a lot. And I'm going on two and a half years with this. If I didn't mention it, you have to be dogged when you're bringing an idea to market, okay? Because it's not going to happen overnight. Very few overnight stories. You hear of these overnight success stories, but they're, they're not. They're not overnight at all. They've taken a long time. Now, market testing is when you have this functional prototype, and now it's time to unleash it on the world, at least the world that you're targeting. So you're trying to find dedicated testers that are willing to give up their time and provide their feedback to actually try your product out and provide that feedback. And this is where it can be really hard because trust me, humans like to provide feedback, which may not always be good. And it may be hurtful to you to receive that feedback. I've been there, done that. Um, real quick story. When, so I went down to Ford Motor Company and uh, I was showing them an original prototype. And this thing was about the size of a small satellite dish which by the way, when it finished, it was the size of a quarter. So imagine seeing something about the size of a satellite dish fixed to a car. People thought, are you, are you crazy? Who would buy this? It looks silly. The point was to prove that it worked and it, it did do what it claimed it did. So it got me by. But when I went into one of their large multi-billion dollar suppliers that they recommended I go see, I won't mention the company name, but I stood there with my presentation and this large prototype that was very functional. And literally the back of the room, I heard a bunch of engineers laughing. 
oh, that was so, so almost humiliating. Okay. Like, who are you to laugh at my product? I'm solving a problem that you guys haven't solved. That's how you have to respond to that in your own mind and move forth, as I did. Okay. And Ford ended up taking the product on, long story short, for a period of time until I got out of the business. Okay. So beta tests, the dollar sign, it's about the same, maybe time a little bit less. I normally give beta tests anywhere from a week to a month, even a day sometimes, just to try the product out to get their feedback. I provide a written survey for them to complete. I also try and get a, you know, these days on my phone, I get a video log of what they thought of the product. And that offers a lot of credibility because when you're trying to talk to an investor potential, if that's the route you're going to go, if it's just you putting your passion forth for this and nobody else to support it, it doesn't hold as much water, okay? So try and get as much feedback as you can. And of course, the market feedback you receive is going to come back to you and you're going to maybe want to make refinements in the product. Ultimately, though, you, uh, you get to where you better have some money in your pocket because you go to the production phase. And production phase means you have a minimum viable product. Uh, it, it looks sharp. It does all the bells and whistles you need it to do for the most part. It's all packaged up in a blister pack and there's instructions and so on and so on. But this is where it gets expensive for most people because in the prior stages of stage step four and five, you may be using something like a 3D printer if it's a physical product. If it's a piece of software, it's a lot easier. You're working in a sandbox environment, you're writing code and you can demonstrate on your phone. It's a lot easier to write software for a product idea than it is to bring a physical element to the market. That's in my opinion, having done both. Yeah. But when you get to the production stage of anything physical, if it's outside of the hobby sector where you're only going to be making a few hundred that you can make by hand, that's great. Okay? You get your satisfaction from that. But if you're looking to bring it to market, which means you're going to be dealing more in the thousands or whatnot, you're going to have to go to the next degree, which is normally a mold. 3D printers, you know, maybe in the hundreds, low thousands maximum, because it's just not cost effective. And they're, and they're not as high resolution quality wise. So consider that. There are also CNCs, so com computer numerated machine control, CNC or something like that. Um, they will do a higher resolution, but they're still very expensive. Whereas when you get a mold, the mold be very might be very expensive, like a minimum several thousand dollars to, in this case, the device I'm working on right now, the one quote I've had, which is too high, it was $70,000 US for the mold. So it can get very expensive very quickly. But after that mold is done, the pieces that come out, especially if they're injection mold, polycarbonate or whatnot, they're pennies. And that's where your gross profit margin is proved because the cost of goods sold is very low. Okay. Now, if you can get a good team together, which you may have to compensate by way of future benefits, future equity, perhaps, because you may not have any money at this point. I know I certainly don't want to bring a product to market that's going to cost a lot of money. So you bring advisors to the table. You, you compensate them somehow down the road. You bring team members on from there and so on. And hopefully you can you know, find investment and whatnot. Ultimately, the product release is where you're really going to spend a lot of money. Okay. Ultimately, you may actually be having to do a version two or a version three, depending on how the thing goes. But the cost of selling product these days, you know, there's two ways to do it. There's brick and mortar, meaning in a store, in a Home Depot, in an electronics store or something, or there's e-commerce online, your own websites, Shopify, Amazon, and so on. They can certainly look after a lot of the stuff, but ultimately you're dealing a lot of quantities. You still have to get all that stuff made and make sure the support system, the infrastructure is all set up to process it. It can take a lot of time and a lot of money. I'll give you a quick example of my own basis. So I've uh, aligned with someone who has a lot of connections in the bicycling arena, and they know some influencers who are like world-class and they believe that they'll love the idea. 
Well, these influencers get around anywhere from five to fifteen thousand dollars a month for them just to post. If you want a nice job, become an influencer if that's what you can do. But so it's expensive. It's a channel to go through, but if you're looking to really hit the market hard, then you need influencers these days. And I myself, I'm not a big enough influencer to just do it on my own. So I will be seeking outside influencers and I'll do it through whatever means necessary. There's also, um, I, I can tell you CTV, for example, they're one of the individuals within CTV is aware of my invention. They've already told me they want to interview me because they think the product is cool. By the way, the person doing it is a bicyclist. It's going to make sense. Okay? So free advertisement is the best. It always has been. Uh, it can be a double-sided sword or a double-edged sword. I remember uh, I had the Ottawa Citizen come and actually look at this one product I had before it sort of hit the market. And they looked at it and they wrote this whole page article up and this was print back then. And they said, I'll always remember it, quote unquote, best invention since the, the blank. And I go, wow, have I ever hit the gold mine here? I've invented something that's better than this. Okay. It really, it set the bar too high for me in retrospect. So make sure you don't get uh, your ego too inflated because it can be quickly deflated very mm -hmm. easily. All right. Now, this whole step process. And there are, and by the way, if you search online, you will find different, you will find people saying phases, they will add in, they will, some are three-step processes and so on. I've tried to take based on my experience what I feel it is. But roughly speaking, if you've got a piece of hardware, meaning something physical, you're looking at one to three years, if you're lucky, to, to get it to market. Assuming there's no regulatory hurdles. One of the regulatory things I had to deal with when you're dealing with something in the automotive market is that I literally had to get a vehicle to smash in to a massive brick wall at a testing center in Quebec at high speed to see if my product survived. That was a $55,000 test back then, which totaled the vehicle. By the way, the product survived and it worked great afterwards. Got that on old V8 camera, all the film work. Okay. So when you've got regulatory hurdles, it can be painful, especially if they're, if government is connected, it's, it can be really painful. If you're on the, on the pharmaceutical side, you've got the federal drug administration, the FDA to, to go through. Okay. So be careful, do your early homework, just to make sure you aren't really disappointed down the road to say, Oh my God, I had no idea I had to get this regulation approved. What's that going to cost me? Okay, CSA testing, Canadian Standard Association, if you have to get it, can, can set you back 20,000 bucks for a site visit. So keep that in mind, okay? Now, the one thing I didn't mention on here was licensing. Licensing, I'm not going to, yeah, because it's a topic in itself. You can take an idea, like literally from a sketch or a minimal, not quite an MVP, but some low fidelity product that shows the concept. And if you get protection with that, especially patents are really valuable when you license the credibility, you can license the idea. So the manufacturer bears all the risks, the licensee bears all the risks of making the product, getting it built, getting it packaged, getting it serviced, all this technical support. They do all of that. And in return for you giving them some rights, anywhere from regional to all the way exclusive, you get a percentage royalty, okay? Typically ranges from like a couple of percent to maybe 15% if you're lucky. That would imply there's a high profit margin on the product because you're getting that big of a royalty split, okay? So licensing, there's a lot of licensing firms out there. I will caution you, there are a lot of, we'll call them questionable firms out there they will be very happy to take your money. I won't mention any names. You can do your research. Do your Better Business Bureau, Bureau of Reviews. Even Reddit will give you good reviews on things. And they'll say, oh, listen, bring your idea to us. We'll look after it. Oh, give us five or $10,000 too. And trust me, most people go nowhere. Okay? 
I can rough, I'm referencing uh, the USPTO. It's something like less than 5% of the patents that are actually, the patents that are issued. So we're not talking about all the thousands of people that try to submit an application and never get the patent granted, let alone all the tens of thousands of people that have an idea and never even try for a patent. But those that actually get it patented, you're talking in the very small percent groups, five, ten percent that actually bring the product to market. So yeah, they, they've got a patent on their wall and it looks great, but they never did anything with it because the steps are just too high. The hurdles are too high to overcome. So keep all that in mind, not to discourage you. In fact, contrary to that, humans don't plan to fail; they fail to plan. So get your paper and pencil out and start sketching out what you think the big picture looks like. How long will it take you to come up to find a solution to a perceived problem? How long will it take you to come up with you know, feedback? Does the market really think you need it? How long will it take you to actually come up with something that sort of looks like what you're conceiving in your mind or on your sketch paper? And so on and so on. Okay, I will tell you, from what I've seen here on visualizing on the screen, the videos I see, you all have plenty of time. If you're my age, you know, the window's a lot smaller. You know, if it takes one to three years to bring a product to market and you're already, you know, up there in age, you've got to be on your game. Okay? And the good news is I've got experience, so I'll make it happen. It's just a matter of time. All right. So, this, I sort of alluded to this earlier, of course, that's Albert Einstein. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's Thomas Edison. Einstein would be impressed. But, you know, not everybody's going to have the same vision you have of your idea. So I'll, I'll give you a, some insight here. Never tell your idea to someone really close to you. Which sounds kind of strange to say. They would support you the most, right? I guess there's exceptions to that. But generally speaking, familiarity breeds contempt. You may have someone really close to you, uh, socially, relationship-wise, sibling-wise, whatever the case may be. If you've never done it before, you're not an inventor to them. You're just their sibling or your spouse or whatnot. So in their mind, you know, how would you be able to come up with something to solve this problem? Why should I believe you? So I've, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> when I have an idea, I write it down. I've got an idea book. Keep an idea book beside your bed, okay? Learn to write in the dark, okay? Check it in the morning. That way you don't forget it and you'll be able to go to sleep. But I don't convey ideas to people that I trust until I've got something a little more solid than just an idea that flung off the top of my head, okay? Whereas if you go to people in that have some background or knowledge about your idea, get them to sign an NDA and so on, their feedback will probably be more genuine and will, will be short of all the familiarity aspect. Okay. But, uh, you know, Edison had, uh, I think, near 2,800, nearly 3,000 patents. Okay. Crazy. But you know, he had thousands of attempts on getting the filament right on his light bulb. Actually, I'm getting the reverse. I think he had just over a thousand patents, but it took him close to 3,000 attempts to get the right kind of a filament that would burn properly and for a period of time in that electric light bulb. And by the way, he wasn't the first to invent the light bulb. There were other people that did it. He had a better mousetrap. So it comes back to this original idea. You know, maybe the better mousetrap is a better idea to come up with as opposed to inventing the mousetrap. Now, th this I found because of what I just said about not necessarily sharing things with people close to you. Um, inventing is, is a very lonely passion for a lot of people. So for whatever you can, find your outlets to, you know, give your brain a rest. You know, surround yourself with family and friends who are supportive, who at least know you're working on things. If your network is not supportive of what you're doing, even though they may not understand it and you may not have fully shared it with them, if they're not supportive, trust me, it's just going to make the uphill battle even more uphill. Try to connect with various groups. There's, oh, there's, there's, no, there's no end to them. They're all over the place. But some major ones are the Canadian Venture Association, Inventors Groups of America. That's a, that's a big one. It's a good one. 
I was actually interviewed by uh, one of their affiliates some time ago. Um, they've got a lot of feedback they can offer you. And these are, you know, there, there might be some small membership fee, like hundred bucks or something like that. Some of them, a lot of them are free, especially on Facebook. Um, Facebook is a, is a good source. Again, you tend to get what you pay for, but you can filter out the noise as you get through it. Uh, and then there's places like universities. So Queens has this partnerships and innovation program. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm under their wing on that. They provide a lot of good feedback, a lot of sounding boards and so on. So at that point, uh, good, no one fell asleep, cool. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have, if any at all. If you have questions, you can, you can either unmute yourself or you can add it into the chat. Sure, I have a question for you, uh, Mike. Please. Um, I'd like to go back to your uh, your seven step process here, and I I'd like to know if you'd say that it would also apply to uh, social media apps. And my the reason I ask is is the following: to just give you a little context. So I'm building a consumer app. I've done the prototyping. I did it in a no code website, and now I'm you know at an inflection point, thinking to myself: Do I just build like the basic app, drop it on the app store and see if it gains traction. But then I'm concerned that somebody can come around and say, hey, you know what, I can build something, you know, more fully developed and then just kind of short or short circuit me. Or do I market test it by sending around and, you know, a secret link to, you know, different people. But then my concern becomes biased because, you know, would most likely be family and friends. So I'd like to get your, your take on that. Like what does it apply to apps and what should be the next step after a prototype? Is there any protectable in your mind, any protectable process or algorithms or whatnot? No, not at this point. All right. So, you know, once you release it out there, if there's nothing like that, it's out there hmm. and anyone can take it. But I, I will share this with you from a, a sense of reality. Um, You'll hear this from investors a lot. They're concerned that, oh, it looks like such a simple idea. What have you got to protect it? You know, so it can be copied so easily. Here's the reality. And this is my sense of reality. Yes, it could very well be copied and become a better mousetrap down the road. But at the end of the day, people that will do that are only going to do it if they think there's a real opportunity. And how is that determined? Well, you have to create the traction. You actually have to show that this is viable for the market. So if you're in a, a crowdfunding program, which by the way, you may want to do, um, you know, there are literally people out there whose jobs, call them ethical or not, are to sit and, wa sit and watch what on the fence, what new ideas come onto crowdfunding programs and maybe take it and run with it. And they can view about what the feedback is and what the interest is by the amount of money that these people are attracting. But if you're under the radar, at the end of the day, even when you bring the product to market, if you're not selling millions of these things yet, you're still under the radar. So don't worry about it. Do what protection you can. You know, from a software perspective, we sandbox ideas to keep it from the public viewing domain to make sure it's being tested properly. Give those samples out to people that you trust. Get them to sign an NDA. Mm -hmm. Concept-wise, you can still do that. So you know, most, still people most people don't like the threat of being sued. So no. if they're willing to sign a confidentiality agreement in some form or another. They'll usually abide by that. I've, I've never had an issue except once. So you still recommend doing some market testing with an app before dropping it on an app store? Oh, def definitely. Okay, perfect. Definitely. Yeah. Because you may end up, you know, having wrote a lot of software and spent years ago uh, and spent a lot of time in the wee morning hours fixing patches at three in the morning because someone in Australia called me and said this feature wasn't working. If I had tested it better, I would have been sleeping at that 3 a.m. mark, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. From Jason, what are the steps for filing a patent? Okay. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, Jason, you'll want to seek professional opinion if you know nothing about it. Even prior to that, do some research to find a little bit of lingo. But I will generally tell you, it, it's consistent in most parts of the world, the Western Hemisphere at least. But you know, if you're going to target a market, the market you normally target is the U.S. because it's a larger market. Um, they have a process for why you can file a provisional patent. So it's a very limited document. 
which as a micro entity, meaning a single one sole inventor, it's like less than $100. And you file that non-provisional patent to give you a priority date that ultimately your non-provisional patent will backdate to that date that you filed earlier with the provisional patent. Okay. Now, Canada doesn't have that non or that provisional patent aspect, but there's a bit of a workaround, sort of. You can file an incomplete patent in Canada and within the year, file the, the full application. So you, you save a little bit of time is when you have to pay up. Okay. But ultimately, once you get your application, the non-provisional filed in the US, for example, there's a waiting period that occurs. And depending, I think my most recent one, I didn't get an action back for well over a year. So you've got a bit of a time window before you have to start coughing money up, assuming your patent is going to be granted and so on, to have the protection to go out and reference patent pending, which adds a little bit more credibility when you're talking to people. Okay. Did that answer the question? Uh, there's, there's also, by the way, outside of North America, so there's a thing called PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty. Um, in essence, European countries have a, a, a simpler path to get started by where you file your application through PCT, and it has a recognition connectivity for date stamping to roughly about 100 and, I think it's about 150 countries. Okay. Now, you will ultimately have to pick from that list and say, okay, I think my market, it's a food product, so I definitely want to get it into Italy because Italy has a lot of shipping ports where stuff goes all around the world, so I want to make sure I've got patent protection there. You would, within the PCT, make sure you select Italy where you're going to file directly, get it translated, pay the, the regional fees and all that stuff. This is where money can really start to tap your resources. Um, I don't want to scare you off, but one of the products I brought to market, I spent over $250,000 on patents. In hindsight, hmm, I think I would have done it differently knowing what I know now. But you can quickly spend money in this. So be very focused in what you want to do. And I would generally say, you know, make sure you seek guidance and counsel. Um, you know, tap into Queens if you have access to it. They have great people there. And I won't mention names. I don't want to you know, jam up their email inbox or whatnot. But, you know, that being said, seek whatever guidance you can. And it's out there. But it, it can be done, relatively cost effective. And if you can get that one year window before you have to spend a lot of money on the application fees, and let alone the maintenance fees, which happen every, you know, couple of years and so on, um, you've got a year to figure out, is this really going to happen? Can I find investment for it? Or can I spend my own family and friends money or whatever the case may be? Or can I do a crowdfunding thing? You are protected within that window. And hopefully by the end, just prior to the year where you actually have to pay up, you know whether or not it's going to be viable to do so. Any other questions? I, I love answering stuff. I'll, I'll be honest with you. A lot of inventors, I've, I've helped a lot over the years. And, uh, you know, call it pay it forward. Ultimately, all humans on the planet are inherently selfish. It's how we're wired. I from a psych perspective now, by the way. But we can be altruistic and want to help people because it makes us feel good. And I do that. So, um, you know, if you want to touch base with me offline, feel free to do that. If it's not a long-winded thing or a lot of typing required, I'll respond back. But a lot of inventors, especially if you get into the groups, they want to help you. Okay, it, it's just a, kind of their nature. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so if there's no other questions, maybe we'll wrap it up there. Um, so we have, you may have noticed, uh, we've recorded this session. Um, we will we'll be posting it on our. Um, Queen's Partnerships and Innovation YouTube channel um, in in the next week or so and um, I will send the link out to everybody who's who's registered and who is here um, you'll you'll get a follow-up email with the link to the recording perfect thank you so much for coming out today and thank you Mike Pleasure, for, everyone. for presenting uh, happy inventing <laughs> thank you thank it you can, it can be very rewarding
take care and uh, good luck with all the inventing you do. Bye.